This video is not going to be disparaging against Knowledge Graph. In fact, it's really a educational source for those that are questioning if Knowledge Graph is right for them. A lot of these questions are from real people that I have worked with and that I have talked to that are experiencing this buy-in issue. We all get pushback on Knowledge Graph. You know, honestly, not all technologies are right for all use cases. This video is really talking about the pitfalls and the things that I often get asked by those that have either not done Knowledge Graph at all or are investigating whether they really want to get into it or not. Because my whole channel is focused on helping you with that journey. Is it right for you? When do you need to get into it? What do you need? What are some of the tools? All of that is what this channel is all about. But one thing we haven't talked about yet is are you ready for Knowledge Graph? And is it ever going to be something that you want to dive into? I am not going to tell you that you will never get into Knowledge Graph. That's not what this video is about. All of the things I go through in this video are not blanket statements. You can use Knowledge Graph for whatever you want to use it for. This video is really just talking about the things that I have found and colleagues of mine have found to be the most effective way of deciding if Knowledge Graph is right for you at this time, because you certainly want to keep revisiting all the new technologies that are available to you, including Knowledge Graph, periodically to find out, is it still not right for you? Or can you finally jump into those waters? So if this sounds interesting to you, let's get started. All right, so we are going to go over three different aspects of why you might or might not want to get into Knowledge Graph right now. And the first one we're going to talk about is staffing, because I often hear, well, I don't have any Knowledge Graph experts. That's okay. There's actually a lot of third parties out there that will help you get your Knowledge Graph started. However, <laughs> if you don't have anyone on staff that is like the data guru, the person who kind of knows where all the bodies are buried when it comes to data, you need that, that data connoisseur to partner with any third parties you would bring in for Knowledge Graph. So if you really don't have a point person for your data, especially the data you want to use potentially in a Knowledge Graph, maybe you need to identify that first before you get started. The next is if you or your stakeholders think that Knowledge Graph is the sexy thing to do, or it's a fad, or oh, it's just hype, or you know, this is just something that the cool kids are doing. You might wanna do some more research before you get started, because first of all, Knowledge Graph is not just a fad. It is in the hype cycle, obviously, but if you watch anything on my channel, and I really encourage you to do so if you aren't doing that already, there's a lot of people already using Knowledge Graph in real production environments. It is a real thing that a lot of people find value in. I'll put a video up above if you want to go and check out some basic use cases for Knowledge Graph that are used all the time. So if you are in that camp or your stakeholders are in the camp of mm, Knowledge Graph is just a fad, then definitely make sure you talk to them first before you get started in anything in the Knowledge Graph space. The next kind of go hand in hand. So Knowledge Graph is cheap. It's something that we can get into and there's a lot of open source stuff out there. We don't really need to spend a lot of money in Knowledge Graph. Now, that's true in a sense. There are a lot of open source tools for Knowledge Graph, but to actually put it into production and get it really giving you benefit for your business, it's going to cost some time, some resources, and some money. And we will go over more of that in the last section of this video where we are talking about the use cases and the resources. But suffice it to say, it's not the cheapest thing to get into. And you need to make sure that you budget it and you make sure that you are talking to your stakeholders realistically. And if your stakeholders are not thinking about this realistically, then it's probably not a good time to get into it for now. You need to do some homework before you do that. And along that same vein, knowledge graph is just magic. Just like machine learning, it's just magic. You just buy one and it works. It's just fabulous, it's great. That's not true. There's a lot of work that you have to put into this. You need to be able to support it once you create the knowledge graph. Make sure that the data is constantly getting revamped. It's a living, breathing data set that if you don't have a lot of the mechanisms in place or, or are willing to plan and, and put resources towards supporting this thing, 
it's probably not something you want to do right now. And the last thing on the staffing question is if you have not done a POC yet, first, you should probably do that first before you do anything else. We will talk about that later in the video. But once you have some buy-in for Knowledge Graph, you need to at least set aside three months it doesn't have to be consecutive, but a three month time period of some sort with your teams or team that is going to be working with this or maintaining this because you need to have that time for them to get up to speed on what is a knowledge graph? What are these query languages? How do I get the ingest to work correctly? If you don't set aside that time, if you're not willing to do that, it's probably not good to jump into Knowledge Graph right now because you're going to have shelfware and you don't want that. Now, the other thing is there's a lot of stuff that you can do to, you know, pre-teach, you know, like go take, uh, and I'll put a link down below to a great course on like basic Knowledge Graph stuff. Yeah, go take that so you get up to speed on the lingo, but until your staff really understands what is this going to do for me, me and and they don't really care all the time about the business. They want to care like, why should they care? And that's for you to figure out and to make sure that they are bought in as well. It's not just the stakeholders that need buy-in. It's also the engineers and the folks that are building all of this as well. So if you haven't done that yet, you probably want to put a, a, a pause at least on that knowledge graph work you're thinking about. All right, so now jumping into the next section, which is data. So with data, you can use pretty much any kind of data in a knowledge graph, right? But there's some characteristics that you wanna think about. So in many cases, there are two extremes to each one of these. The very first thing that we're gonna talk about in this category is, is your data really clean, really well understood, and it's pretty straightforward, meaning it, it you don't have to have a lot of complex queries. Your data is, is, is very well structured. Knowledge Graph could potentially still give you something and you should probably do some tests around that. But sometimes Knowledge Graph doesn't need to be there. Maybe it's making it more complicated than it needs to be. I hate that excuse though. So make sure you do some testing around that because Knowledge Graph can give you some great stuff, especially with hidden insights and you don't know if they're hidden until you test it. But at the end of the day, you might just determine that it's too much uh, for the squeeze you have to put into it, right? On the other side of the coin with that is your data is gnarly. Now, everybody has dirty data, don't get me wrong, but your data, in this case, gnarly. You don't know where anything is. You're maybe taking it from a new a, a company that you acquired and you don't know what's in there, who did it, what, what's MVP, you don't know anything. That's probably something you want to clean up, figure out what you actually need from that data before you jump into all the knowledge graph stuff. At this stage, you probably don't even have a, a straightforward schema all of that needs to be really figured out. Um, and I'm not saying it has to be totally clean. That's not true. Knowledge Graph can work with lots of dirty data as well. But if you really don't know where anything is at all, then you probably want to figure that out first before you get started with Knowledge Graph. All right, the next is, does it have three joins or less? So the reason I kind of use that three joins or less, the joins in your data is really what the Knowledge Graph is enhancing is do you have multiple tables that are connected together? Yes, great. Well, if you don't know how those are connected, there's institutional knowledge as to why these things are connected and how they're connected and why that's important to your business and how that data is used in other systems, processes, that sort of thing. It's all hidden, you don't know what it is. That's where Knowledge Graph really shines is how those things are connected, specifically, semantically, writing out how these two things are, are related. If you don't have a lot of joins, then there's not a lot of added benefit that the Knowledge Graph will give you because that's really the sweet spot for Knowledge Graph is all the, the inherent joins. That's what a Knowledge Graph does is the joins are native to a knowledge graph instead of you having to join them constantly all the time. You're basically like pre-creating them with those links. And sort of similar to that is, you know, you really need to understand out of all the queries you have, all of the data you have, what's MVP to your business? Now, 
not all of us know everything that's MVP in, in our systems. If you have a data catalog, you probably have a better understanding of this, by the way. So if you have that data catalog, it's going to really help you determine what queries are being used the most or what queries are being used for the most important dashboards or for the most important product or insights and what data is supporting it. Again, if you don't have a data catalog, you can still understand this, of course, but data catalogs are super helpful for this. But if you don't really know all of that, you're going to have a really hard time understanding what's important to put into a knowledge graph and what's not as important to put into a knowledge graph. So before getting into it, you should probably figure that out first. All right, so the next is knowledge graph is in many cases, but not all, not the greatest at what I would consider very um, well understood transactional data. So if you are going to be using Knowledge Graph for transactional data, I've seen this the most with like IoT and sensor kind of data or like, you know, the digital twin stuff. But, you know, if if your transactional data is this user ID and you don't know who they are, it's it's just, you know, like an IP address kind of thing and a session ID and they bought these things and it was this price. If that's really all your transactional data is, Knowledge Graph doesn't always add a lot more to that. However, what it does help with is if you roll it up to a level of abstraction. So for instance, these customers, as, as a node customer, are constantly buying these products at this price during this time. That kind of stuff is useful in a knowledge graph, but it's abstracted up. It's not looking at the individual user and their behavior. And on the same coin, but different side is the knowledge graph stuff is, is great when you have a lot of that complex, you know, things have a lot of different types of relationships with other things. But if you have like a flat list or like lookup tables, those of course might feed into a knowledge graph at some point, but those themselves will not be a knowledge graph. So those are things that um, you don't necessarily need all of that um, connective tissue to understand because let's say you just have a flat list of um, you know, company names. Do you need to know how those companies are related to each other or is it just a lookup table for something else? Next up is, can you actually define what each of your tables and each of your metadata pieces actually mean? So what do I mean by this? Do you know how to define what a customer is in your data? And would all of your other stakeholders and people using this data define it the same way? If you can't do that, you probably want to work on a common definition of these things before you get started into a knowledge graph because a knowledge graph is essentially synthesizing what this, this node is and how it connects to other things. But if you're not sure how that thing is defined, your modeling is gonna be really wonky. And another thing is, Knowledge Graph is very dedicated to unique IDs, whether you are in the property graph space or the triple store. If you're on the triple store, like RDF side, you really need to have good UIDs. And if you don't have them quite yet, that's still okay, but you need to have some metadata element that you can turn into a URI or a unique identifier so that you can make the Knowledge Graph really robust and you don't have a lot of conflicts because that happens a lot if you don't do this ahead of time. And the next two, are you actually looking at KPIs? Are you measuring how much time, money, resources go into any of your um, dashboards or your analytics or your end machine learning projects or whatever it is that you're using your data for today? Are you measuring that? Because to understand if Knowledge Graph is right for you, you wanna do some benchmarking. If you don't measure what you have now, how are you going to do benchmarking? And it shouldn't be, well, I feel like it only takes me a day to do this actually find out so that when you do a POC, you actually have an apples to apples comparison and understand what is the acceptable threshold. So often I hear Knowledge Graph cuts down on the amount of time that people have to do, you know, analytics and how they would spin up new queries and that sort of thing. They're right, but if you don't know how much time it takes you to do that stuff now or how much it costs you to maybe run a very complex query and how long it takes to run it, you're not going to know if Knowledge Graph is useful to you because you don't know what your current state is. So make sure you have that outline before you do anything else. All right, now switching into the use case area of this video. So if you don't already have a consumer 
or consumers set up for your graph data, you probably want to figure that out first because you don't want to build shelfware. So often I see so many people building out these beautiful models and they're populating it with great data. And then the downstream applications don't know how to use graph data or they can't query whichever database they're using or the you know analysts or whoever it is that's using the data or the products that are using the data downstream don't know what to do with it. That's a problem. You need to figure that out before you do anything with graph. And graph is not always the right solution for those things. Can you do a recommendation engine without a knowledge graph? Yes. Is it going to be not as good? I would suspect because it's not going to understand all that really rich connective data that you get with a knowledge graph. But can you do it? Yes. And if your business is only signing up for that very lightweight use case for a recommendation engine, then you need to work with your stakeholders to understand the real business proposition before you go any farther with Knowledge Graph because you're going to be in for a long road ahead if you're building things and you don't already have some of that buy-in originally. The next is uh, very situational. And that is if you are a new department or if you are a new business, like a startup, you might not want to start with graph first. Now, if your whole business is predicated on the fact that you're going to have this great graph database, awesome, you do you do that, that's, that's great. But if you don't have the skills yourself and you are a startup, which means you don't have a lot of capital yet, which means that first thing I said in the video where you can use third parties is probably not available to you because you don't wanna spend the cash on that. You can get people in that know relational much faster and a much better price point than you can with folks that do Knowledge Graph. So even if Knowledge Graph is, is your end goal, maybe start with relational first just so you can get some of that additional help in early on and you can get something out the door and you can mock what you want to do with Knowledge Graph, you know, for some of that seed funding. But then you get into real graph after you get the seed funding because that's probably gonna be a better option for you. So the next is kind of three parts. If your main use case for your business doesn't care about behavioral understanding or cause and effect or relatedness between things, those are the main reasons you use Knowledge Graph. So if you're not doing some of those things or they're not important to your business, then Knowledge Graph might not be right for you right now. Again, do some POCs, understand what might be helpful in these three categories for your business, and maybe that's your excuse to get into Knowledge Graph, but don't do Knowledge Graph if you think it's just the cool thing to do. That's a lot of what this video is about too, is there should be real business need into going into this, not just it's the cool thing to do. And last but certainly not least is what does a good POC look like for Knowledge Graph? If you're not willing to put that effort in, you're probably not going to be set up for success. So I usually like to start with a small team uh, between one and five people usually. And uh, that three month time period that we talked about earlier with training also applies here. By the way, I use three month because that's um, the program increment that I use in Agile. So it's like a three month time period for, for any dev work. That's why I use three months, but use whatever you're using for increments um, at your company. And most of the time when you are spinning up your POC, you want to scale it appropriately. And there are so many that get into Knowledge Graph and they have all these big promises and they want to just tackle the data world. And those are all great and, and aspirational and passionate, but scoping it to Take one of the most complex queries, just one query that you have, or one dashboard that you have, or if you're trying to look at um, adding more context to a machine learning model, take that one use case and use that as your model. Is it going to be a teeny tiny itty bitty graph? It is. But that also makes it easier to discuss and turn it over to non-graph people to kind of play around with and kind of see what, what graph actually gives to them. And that's what you have to do is have that POC that's small enough that you can spin it up very quickly and get your stakeholders really understanding what it is. And stakeholders are not always the folks that are signing the check. Oftentimes it's the architects or the folks that are uh, developing epics at, at your company. 
They need to believe that this is more than a fad for them to really buy into it. All right, so that was my whirlwind of things that you might want to consider before you jump into Knowledge Graph. And you might really want to consider, is Knowledge Graph ripe enough right now for your business to grab into? And it's not because it's not beneficial to your business. It's because your business isn't really ready for it. So that's where you have to kind of take a step back and start to educate your business on what is really useful and do some mini POCs and really start to look at how the rest of the market is using it before you get started in it. 